This program is brought to you by the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors, promoting political advocacy, education, and the ethical conduct of its members nationwide. Welcome to NAFA's latest edition of Programs in a Box. I'm Norm Trainer, founder and CEO of the Covenant Group. Our mission at the Covenant Group is to educate and coach financial advisors and provide you with strategies and tactics to grow your business. The focus of the presentation today is building your brand. We're going to start at a high level. What does it take to build your business and then drill down to address the simplest and most fundamental question that you are asked, what do you do? But before we get to that, let's just look at uh, how advisors grow their business. Typically, we find that financial advisors want four things. You want to make more money, whether you're making a five-figure, six-figure, seven-figure, or eight-figure revenue stream. Most advisors want to make more money. And it may have nothing to do with lifestyle and everything to do with meaning. Money is just a measure of the difference we're making in the work we do. The second is to have more quality time. For many advisors who've been in the business 10, 15, 20, or 30 years or more, the zest or passion that brought them into this business has waned. And they want to re-engage in the business and reignite that enthusiasm. The third element is we all want to have more fun. We want to have more fun in every area of our lives, work, family, community, self, and our own growth and development. And finally, we're looking for financial security and independence. Those are the four things that we work with you to achieve. Make more money, have more quality time, have more fun, and achieve long-term financial security and independence. Now, typically, when we ask advisors what is your vision for growth? We get a trajectory that looks like this. Advisors say they want to grow their business 5, 10, 15, 20 percent, and they describe it as a linear projection that every year they're going to advance. One of the things we know is that businesses don't grow linear. The typical growth curve is curvilinear, and in fact, as you grow your financial advisory practice, you will go through three distinct paradigms. A paradigm does two things. First, it establishes the boundaries within which we operate. And secondly, it uh, outlines or defines the rules for success. When we start out as a financial advisor, we are in a sales paradigm. The primary role is to acquire clients and to grow the business. And typically, in that first phase of growth, the startup phase, we are looking to define ourselves and uh, to find a pattern of success that we can replicate. And if we're able to do that, growth ensues. And sometimes that growth can be exponential. But at a point in time, we reach the first apex or peak. And that represents a ceiling of complexity. Typically, that occurs when your revenue hits about 150 to 200,000, and now you're beset with service demands, compliance requirements, uh, underwriting uh, challenges. And what the Million Dollar Roundtable tells us at that point is you have to bring in an administrative assistant, or alternatively, or perhaps both, you have to begin to focus on a higher quality of client. When we start out, we will sell anyone who will fog a mirror. But over time, as we become more successful, we need to gear our efforts to the right client with the right value proposition at the right price, by price fair exchange of value. Typically at that phase, though, we now need to redefine ourselves. And if we bring in an assistant, focus on right client, right value proposition, right price, we start another growth trajectory. 
But at a point in time in the future, we will again need to redefine ourselves. And here we move from a sales paradigm to a marketing paradigm. And that's typically at the three to four hundred thousand dollar income level. And now we need to focus on building our brand. And we will again go through iterations in that growth. When you reach a high six figure or low seven figure revenue stream, you are building a business. Now the irony of success today is that whether your income is five figures or six figures or seven figures, you still have to run your practice as a business. Each of you is an entrepreneur who has chosen to be in financial services. And you have to think and act like an entrepreneur. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But there are four issues we want to address at a high level as you build your brand. The first, as I've just described, is this transition from sales to marketing to business, to thinking of yourself as an entrepreneur. The second is that the financial services role has become much more complex and will continue to be more challenging, whether it's through the function of compliance or regulation, uh, challenges in the marketplace economically, uh, aging of population, whatever those things are, the business is becoming more demanding. And the demographics and psychographics of financial advisors is changing. The average age of insurance-based financial advisors in North America today is 58. Only 3% of financial advisors are under the age of 35. We have an aging population. And finally, would anyone argue with the fact that the environment is more challenging today than it has been over the last 5, 10, 20, or 30 years? So how do we address these issues? It starts with recognizing how you manage your practice growth curve. As I described earlier, in the startup phase, what we are looking for is a success pattern that we can replicate. And when we identify that pattern, we experience a phase of growth. But over time, we either begin to exhaust our own resources or the resources of the environment, and we reach a stage of maturity. At that point in time, our business is either going to decline or we're going to redefine. In a sense, the irony of success is that what got you where you are will not keep you where you are. One of the challenges we face today is that we are continuously called upon to redefine performance. And that's the fundamental underpinning of what we teach. Now what that requires is that when we reach a ceiling of complexity in our business, we have to repurpose. We have to rethink the way in which we are going about our business. And in some instances, the totality of our lives. And in that repurposing, what we find is renewal. And out of the doubt that is created as a function of hitting a ceiling of complexity, to the degree that we reflect and think about a new future, we are able to renew and begin a whole new growth trajectory. Today, given the complexity with which we deal, we are being called upon to redefine ourselves in shorter and shorter timelines. Adrian Slywatsky is a Harvard Business School professor and a well-known best-selling author. Slywatsky argues that in every business we have to redefine ourselves every three to five years. Otherwise, we risk the erosion of the value in what we do. A guiding tenet in our work is he who fails to plan plans to fail. Or as Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. So in order to continue to grow your business, you have to rethink every aspect of it. And that applies to building your brand and building every aspect of your business. We use a five-phase model to describe 
how you build a sustainable business. It starts with adopting the mindset of an entrepreneur. When you think and act like an entrepreneur, you unlock the potential within your business. The second phase is target. Answering the three R's, who is the right client, what is the right value proposition, and what is the right price. Great businesses have a simple and compelling way in which they describe the value they deliver. In the engage phase, you have to have a client attraction conversation that describes in simple and eloquent terms what makes you unique. A few months ago, I was with my wife at a beautiful Four Seasons resort in Kona on the Big Island in Hawaii. And that resort is rated the number seven resort in the world. And as, I, as we were there, I was thinking, I can't wait to see the other six. It is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful uh, resort in every way, and the staff is incredible. Isidore Sharp, the founder of the Four Seasons, was asked, how is it that the Four Seasons can charge double the room rate of a Hilton or a Weston? He said, it is because we do common things uncommonly well. Now that's about as simple and eloquent a description of how to make a difference in business as I've heard. You too have to be able to describe in a very simple way what makes you unique. The fourth phase is commit, the buying cycle. How you take people through the process of identifying, clarifying, and intensifying their needs, their wants, and their values, and then providing solutions that help them get from where they are to where they want to be. And the final phase is expand. We live in an experience economy. What determines the growth potential within your client relationships is the way you manage the relationship after the sale. What is the type of experience that your clients will have as they deal with you? How do you create a relationship with your clients that becomes one that is lifelong? Those are the five elements of our business builder model. And today we're going to focus specifically on the engage phase. How you create that simple client attraction conversation that can make such a difference. But in order to do that, let's touch on each aspect of those five phases because the paradox in your work is that in order to get the client attraction conversation right, you have to start with mindset. You have to change the way you think before you can change the way you act. Mindset equates to strategy. And strategy is the alignment of three elements. What are the objectives or outputs you want to achieve? Are you building a five-figure business, six-figure, seven-figure, eight-figure, or nine-figure? What are the capabilities and resources you bring to bear to realize those objectives? And finally, what are the opportunities and challenges the environment provides? Target aligns with marketing. You have to have a clearly defined marketing plan and implement a marketing system. The engage phase is the concept you are presenting. How do you make a difference in the lives of your clients? People don't buy products or services. They buy solutions to their problems. What are the problems you're solving for your clients? And what are the solutions you provide? The commit phase equates to the buying cycle. How you take people through the discovery, preparing and presenting your solutions, obtaining commitment and implementation. And in the expand phase, it's all about the client relationship. The most important measure of your success appears nowhere on your balance sheet or your income statement. It is client capital. And client capital is the sum of three elements the depth of relationship you have with your clients. And the most important measure of depth is the number of products and services they will buy from you or the number of products and services where you exercise influence. 
And a key determinant of the, the propensity of a client to buy from you in the future is the degree to which you have built a relationship of trust. The second dimension of client capital is breadth of relationship. Have you made yourself referable? The most important measure of business success from a marketing point of view is word of mouth. It is the testimonials of satisfied clients that make all the difference. To the degree that you have breadth of relationship, your clients will willingly introduce, recommend, and refer you to others within their sphere of influence. And the third element is attachment. The degree of loyalty that clients ascribe to their relationship with you. So those are the five phases, mindset, target, engage, commit, and expand. And they align with strategy, marketing, the concept sale, the buying cycle, and the expand phase, the experience you create for your clients. In mindset, there are three fundamental questions. What role do you want to play? How big do you want to become? And based upon your answer to those two questions, what is the requisite organization? Requisite defined as that which is required by the natural order of things. You may decide that you want to be a business of one. And if that's the case, then in many respects, that's going to put a ceiling on the income that you can earn because all of us have only so much time, energy, creativity, and intelligence with which we can grow the business. But that's okay because if the way in which you want to express yourself is in your unique ability to serve clients, you may do it best as a business of one. Or you may want to become a business of many. Whatever the choice is, it's fundamentally a key decision based upon what fits your value set and your motivation. Typically, we find that financial advisors are either income producers or business builders. An income producer is looking to replace income earned working for someone else through income earned by their own efforts. They are the business and they're their desire is to express their unique ability. And typically the form that takes is in working with clients one-on-one -on -one and in serving them. And the value of the business is tied to their unique ability. Typically when they leave the business, it is either to sell their book or retire and walk away. A business builder is looking to create value separate from himself or herself. They want to leverage the time, the energy, the creativity, and the intelligence of others. And usually they want to build a business that is sustainable beyond their efforts. Now the other issue is, are you building an economic enterprise or a living company? An economic enterprise, the purpose is to create an entity that provides you with a stream of income, and at some point you may sell. A living company is your legacy. You may want to turn it over to children or to junior associates. These are fundamental decisions that define the type of practice or business that uh, you are going to build. And they are central to everything that um, you do. Now, in answering those questions, there are five levels of complexity or, or uh, five levels of thinking about our business that we have to address. And each of those levels of complexity or levels of thinking relate to a specific question. So at the highest level, the first question that we're looking to answer is, what is our business model? And typically in financial services, your business model will take one of three forms. You will be a sole proprietor, a business of one, or maybe a, a, with an administrative assistant. You will build an ensemble. You will bring together a group of, of uh, peers who 
like a jazz quartet, play a higher level or higher quality of music than you can play alone. Or you will be building a financial advisory firm, one that is comprised of a number of people with you sitting at the head. But that's a fundamental decision. And typically, that decision is transformational in nature. Usually, what it requires is that we think about the new business model we want to create. Because for many of us coming into this business, the starting point is to make a living. When you create your business model, it is about making a life and building a business based on meaning. And the measures are shareholder value, the viability of the enterprise, and, and the growth over time. So the first question is, what is your business model? The second question is, within that business model, what products will you offer? What markets will you serve? What ideas will you present? How will you make a difference? Will your focus be narrow on uh, long-term care or annuities or life insurance or, or um, wealth products? Or will it be broad? You're looking to be the chief financial officer for your clients. The third question we need to answer is, how will we uh, implement systems and processes to ensure the, the quality of our business? And that, that question really addresses the, the, the processes you put in place to make your business sustainable and the degree to which you look at effectiveness, how you operate your business over time. The fourth question is, how do you assure quality and continuous improvement? And that's really all about getting better each and every day in your business. As I described uh, earlier, one of the challenges we face is that in a dynamic universe, we are constantly dealing with change. So the status quo only puts us at risk. We need to be constantly improving. And the fifth question, and where the rubber meets the road, is what is service excellence? And that really describes the way in which you operate your business to make a difference for your clients. To answer the question, what is service excellence, the starting point is your business model. So you have to work through each of those five levels. That's really what mindset is all about. Developing the strategy to answer the fundamental questions that are key to building a sustainable business. In terms of the target phase or marketing, how you build your brand, it starts with the three R's. Who is the right client? What is the right value proposition? And what is the right price? Now, let me give you an example. One of the advisors that we work with is a NAFA member. His name is Joel Goodhart. And Joel started in the business in 1976. And Joel, like many advisors when he started out, operated within a sales paradigm. He was a business of one, and he was very good at what he does. And he was able to build a successful practice and become a, a million-dollar roundtable producer. And over the years, Joel began to build his business and evolve it over time. And in the late 70s and the early 80s, he employed a sales paradigm to be successful. In the 90s, when the environment changed, he began to focus more on building his brand. Today, Joel has a firm in Philadelphia called Buyer Financial. And Joel and his two partners, Dennis and Stu, have a team of 11 people. And that team is running a multi-million dollar practice. And over the years, Joel's business has evolved to address the needs of business owners, professionals, and, and uh, largely successful people in uh, a white collar or high income blue collar role. And the business has grown to be much more than the sum of um, Joel's time, energy, creativity, and intelligence. But the starting point for Joel was to evolve his business from a sole proprietorship to where it is now a financial advisory firm. 
And the brand is not only that of Joel Goodhart, but also of Bayer Financial. Now, in building the brand over the last number of years, Joel's approach to the business has evolved. So from a marketing perspective, there are a number of things that Joel and his partners and the whole team do to build their business. One example of that is that for the last seven years, they have hosted a client appreciation event. When they held their first client appreciation event, there were 42 clients. This past November, there were over 500. And that reflects the growth of the business and the growth of the brand. And of those 500, there were over 60 guests that had been brought by clients or centers of influence. And in the previous year, they had 52 guests, and 19 of them became clients within six months of having attended the client appreciation event. So the client appreciation event has morphed into an integration of marketing, sales, and service. It was initially a way of giving back and thanking clients. It still is, but today it not only achieves that purpose, but also attracts new clients and is a way of communicating the value that buyer provides for their clients. So ideally, when you put your strategy together, and that, that then translates into your target, your market, who is the right client, the right value proposition, the right price, everything you do reflects your purpose. And that's certainly true in Joel's case. Another example of their success is that last year, 19% of their revenue came from introductions, recommendations, and referrals from collateral professionals, CPAs and attorneys. And they've built a network that they term partners in progress, and those people have created a, or they've created a symbiotic relationship with them. They refer people, their clients, and in turn they get introductions, recommendations, and referrals. And twice a year, Bayer Financial, in May and September, runs a professional development day for their collateral professionals. And this past September, they had 52 professionals at uh, that function. And of those professionals, there were attorneys and, and CPAs in the room. From 8.30 to 11.30 at their club, they had a professional development day. And each of the attendees got professional development credits. From 11.30 to 1, they had luncheon, and then they teed off and had a golf tournament. These are the examples of the types of activities that build value and build brand over time. Typically, what we teach is that in order to build a sustainable brand, you need to implement six to eight robust promotional strategies or marketing activities. And those activities are implemented in parallel. Three to four will be internal marketing, marketing to people whom you already know, and three to four will be external marketing building your brand in the community. In the case of Buyer Financial, it starts with sales to existing clients. So they've implemented a whole strategy for building an increasing value in their client relationships. It starts with the periodic reviews they conduct with their top clients. In October of each year, they sit down and identify who are their top clients. And in Joel's case, there are about 120 relationships that he's focused on. And with each of those relationships, they map out 10 they will see in January, 10 in February, 10 in March, and they implement a six-step process of periodic reviews. For those that they're meeting with in January, a letter goes out in late November saying Joel would like to meet with them for a review. A week later, 
someone from their office calls to book the appointment. Ten days before the meeting, an agenda is sent to the client. That agenda identifies six or seven items that they want to address in the meeting. And those issues relate to service initiatives, sales initiatives, and, and marketing initiatives. Two days before the meeting, someone other than Joel or Dennis or Stu calls not to confirm the meeting, but to review the agenda because half of the clients will not have read it. Now the client has been touched, in this case, uh, through a letter, a phone call, an agenda, and, and a follow-up call four times before the meeting. They're likely to take that meeting much more seriously than if uh, one of the partners just showed up. And those meetings typically lead to cross-selling, consolidation, upselling, and introductions, recommendations, and referrals. So there's a whole strategy that's mapped out to deepen and broaden the relationships with existing clients. The second key promotional strategy is obtaining introductions, recommendations, and referrals. They have systems and processes in place to assure that they will get a continuous flow of quality introductions, recommendations, or referrals. They also manage their pipeline of prospective clients and drip on those people through newsletters, articles of interest, and, and other material. And finally, from an internal marketing perspective, they both network and net weave. Joel, Stu, and Dennis are all givers. They share in common generosity of spirit. Networking is based on the premise, what can you do for me? Net weaving on the supposition, what can I do for you? Joel, Dennis, and Stu are natural net weavers, and they create a relationship uh, of trust with a broad range of people because of their generosity. The first principle of influence is reciprocity. You give to get. In addition, they also have implemented a number of robust external marketing activities. It starts with their work with collateral professionals, their partners in progress. They also have a website. Uh, they, they do media. I've written uh, two articles about Joel. Uh, they've been published in Forbes magazine and, and other publications. Uh, so they built their brand using social media, the media, uh, and uh, their website. They also uh, market uh, directly with seminars, workshops, and they are heavily involved in the community. All of these activities are critical to building your brand. The fundamental underpinning of your business is trust, and building trust is a process. There are three elements in trust. The first is personal trust, and personal trust is based upon the perception of your integrity your honesty. It is your caring and your intent to make a difference in the lives of your clients. Your clients want to know that you are benevolent. And in this respect, benevolence has a distinct definition. Do you put their interests ahead of your own or do you put your own interests first? Clients want to know that you put them at the center of the experience. The second is professional trust. Professional trust is your expertise, your access to experts, and the results you're able to achieve. One of the most fundamental ways, though, of building trust is through procedural trust. And that's having clear procedures that differentiate you in the marketplace. That's what make great brands like Four Seasons so successful. It's having agreement on the part of yourself and those people with whom you work to follow it. It's managing and communicating your, your systems and processes. And it is three E's. Engagement. You have to manage the way in which you engage with prospective clients and clients. One of the things we know from recent LIMRA and McKinsey research is 
that 29% of the people whom you meet will make a decision in the first one to five minutes whether to do business with you. Another 41% in the first meeting. 70% of the people you meet will decide in the first hour or less to do business with you. Another 24% will take a series of meetings and 6% can take months or years. The way you manage the engagement process is critical to the establishment of trust. The second element is explanation. And the key measure of the secret there is don't explain, illustrate. Use stories, analogies, metaphors. And the third E is expectation clarity. Great businesses communicate very simply their service level agreement, what a client or prospect of client can expect from them. Do you have a service level agreement on one page that describes how you make a difference with your clients? Those are the three E's of trust, and our primary focus is upon procedural trust. Strong procedural trust leads to strong personal trust. It also gives you proactive control over the process, and you use it to build and maintain trust. That's why utilizing such tools as an agenda for each meeting is so important. Conducting periodic reviews with your most important clients. And having a process for obtaining introductions, recommendations, and referrals that enables you to earn the right to proceed. And finally, having standards and processes that you communicate clearly and that people say, wow, that makes a difference. Now coming back to Joel, as I mentioned, Joel and Dennis and Stu are building a financial advisory firm. And when I first started working with Joel, I asked him the question, what do you do? And Joel, at that point in time, had been in the business 32 years. And he said, you know, Norm, I've been in the business 32 years, and I've been struggling with that question for 32 years. And, and I answer it differently. And so I said, Joel, tell me about what makes you successful. Uh, how are you different from other advisors? And he said, you know, if you look at, at what uh, Stu brings, Stu's a lawyer, uh, Dennis has been in the business for over 30 years. I've been in the business for over 30 years. Collectively, the three of us have over 80 years of experience in, in helping clients make the right decisions. What we're really good at doing is helping clients make informed decisions. And I said, Joel, that's how you answer the question, what do you do? When somebody asks you that, you say, we help our clients achieve financial security and independence through informed decision making. Now, Joel ran that through compliance, they got approval, and on their business cards, it says financial security through informed decision making. When any of the partners meet with a prospective client or with a client, they highlight the fact that their point of differentiation is financial security and independence through informed decision making. Everyone in Buyer Financial is passionate about that, and it informs everything they do. All the systems and processes they have put in place are designed to help their clients make informed decisions that are in the client's best interest. So when you meet a client in the engage, or a prospective client in the engage phase, when you're in the client attraction phase and managing that client attraction conversation. There's a simple four-stage structure that we recommend. You, me, us, we. In our experience, the dream of every financial advisor is to attract clients, not pursue them. When you master your client attraction conversation, you will attract clients. You no longer have to pursue them. 
The you, me, us, we structure frames everything you're about. It starts with understanding the two principles of selling. The first is focus on the client or focus on the other person. Make them the center of the experience. And the second is you always earn the right to move to the next stage. You build trust incrementally. In the you, the focus on the other person involves the use of power questions. And those power questions deepen and broaden the relationship you have with a prospective client. The me is your transition statement. One of the principles of influence is reciprocity. In fact, it is the number one principle. You give to get. When you focus on the other person and make them the center of the experience, you create a conversation deficit. They will naturally now want to hear from you. And it is at that point when they turn their attention to you that your transition statement becomes so important. And it goes something like this. Andy, you're exactly the type of client that we want to work with. Let me give you an example of someone whom I think is in a situation similar to yours, whom we've been able to help. The us is your story. And it is the power of your story that is transformative. People treat facts as factors, but make decisions based on feelings. All decisions are emotionally based. So you have to emotionally connect with your prospective client. And you do th that through the power of a story. And the we is your statement of intent or expectation clarity. Based upon what we've discussed, if we could provide that type of service for you, Andy, would that be the basis for us to work together? Now that's the structure of the you, me, us, we. Let's drill down in more detail, starting with power questions. The deeper you can go in a relationship, the more you can ask questions that have meaning for the other person, the greater the value they will see in the relationship. I'll give you an example. A number of years ago, I was referred to the president of a large insurance company. And I asked my nominator at, about him. It turned out that we were about the same age. And he had three children who were exactly the same age as my three children. And so I said to him, tell me, what, what, is the, uh, what are each of the children doing? And the oldest at the time was 21. And he said, well, that's, uh, my nominator said, that's a bit of a sore point because the oldest son, his oldest son dropped out of school and he's actually now living in Dublin, in Ireland. He's working as a bartender. Now, I was born in Ireland, so that intrigued me. When I went to meet with the president, after we'd exchanged a few pleasantries, I said, I understand that you have a 21-year-old uh, who's living and working in Ireland. And he looked at me and said, you really know how to bring up the touchy subjects, don't you? And I said, I gather you're not too excited about that. And he said, no. And as two fathers, we then engaged in a conversation about what it's like when your children don't follow your prescribed path. And after 20 to 25 minutes of sharing our experiences, I knew he would become a client, and we had not yet talked about business. The more you touch people at an emotional level, and you follow a procedure that establishes personal trust, the more likely they are to do business with you. You can ask questions like, what are you truly passionate about? If money were not an issue, how would you spend your time? How was money treated in your family? when you were growing up. We are constructive learners. We learn by constructing upon what we already know. The way money was treated in our formative years shapes our attitudes to money throughout our lives, consciously and unconsciously. What gives you joy? And Bill Backrack's great question, what's important about money to you? Another way to approach this is to ask questions that touch on the totality of your prospective client's experience. 
All of us are trying to keep five balls in the air. Work, family, community, self, and our own spiritual growth and development. One of those balls is a rubber ball. The other four are crystal. Work is the rubber ball. We drop it, it will bounce back. Every one of us has faced failure. In fact, one of the reasons why you are successful in your chosen career is that as a financial advisor, you face failure every day and overcome it. The other four, though, are crystal. Drop them and they may break. So we have to pay attention to family, to our health, uh, to our involvement in community, and to our own spiritual growth and development. When we ask people questions like, tell me about your family, tell me about your health, tell me about your community and, and your involvement in it, uh, your friendships, the people you care about outside of family. Tell me about uh, what's important to you in the world, uh, what gives you meaning, uh, in, in what way are you connected uh, by belief to something greater than yourself. All of these questions take the relationship to a much deeper level. Now the, the me, we've talked about the transition statement. The us is the essence of a story. And in a story, you share an experience that one of your clients had where they faced adversity and you were able to provide the solution. And that solution made a real difference in their lives. Ideally, it was transformative. So for Joe Goodhart, a lot of the work he does is with business owners. And so he will tell a story that goes something like this. You know, Andy, you're exactly the type of client we want to work with. In fact, I have a client who is very similar to you. Like you, he's in his 50s and a successful business owner. And when we first met, he was like many typical entrepreneurs. He was a value creator. And his singular focus was his business. And the risk to which he was exposed was that if his business went down, he would lose everything. We helped him put together a financial plan and a business plan. And one of the things that he recognized through informed decision making was that he needed to diversify his assets. He needed to ensure that if something happened to his business, his family would not be put at risk. Now that strategy was instrumental in helping him survive the economic tsunami that hit in the fall of 2008 because liquidity dried up and because he had a sound financial plan and business plan and his assets were diversified, his bank kept his line of credit open and that was his survival line. If he had lost that, his business would have gone down. That's what we do for our clients. We help them make informed decisions to achieve financial security and independence. If we could work with you in that way, would that be a basis for us moving forward? And when you lay it out in that way, you build agreement throughout the process. Now you have the opportunity to do an exercise and to apply the you, me, us, we to build procedural trust. The irony though is you have to start with mindset. Before you change the way you act, you first have to change the way you think. What informs the structure of you, me, us, we is the way in which you want to build your business. What is your purpose? What is your strategy for growing your business? Target. Knowing who is the right client, what is the right value proposition, and what is the right price by price fair exchange of value. You can structure your client attraction conversation to attract the right client to the right value proposition. In framing your client attraction conversation, you start with the power questions. Prepare those power questions. That requires you to know something about the person that you're meeting to really think through those questions. Then prepare your story. The more they put themselves into that story, the more credibility you will establish, the more trust you will demonstrate. And then finally, you highlight for them how you will work with them to create a better tomorrow. In fact, that's what your work is all about. 
good luck with um, the exercise, and uh, we hope this has been a valuable uh, process for you. Thank you. Thank you for participating in this program. For more information regarding products, programs, services, and other NAFA member benefits, visit www.nafa.org.